Good morning, everyone, for those of you joining us in Canada, and indeed, good afternoon for those of you joining us from Europe. My name is Kathy Murphy, and I am the Vice President of UCAN, the European Union Chamber of Commerce in Canada, and you're all very welcome to our webinar today, uh, another in our Access to Market series, and today we are dealing with CETA and mobility, all you need to know about the CETA's benefits for transportation sectors. And before I introduce our keynote speaker, just a couple of very quick housekeeping items. We would request that you keep your microphones on mute, please, so that um, we just have ease of, um, of uh, scenario for our presenter. And also, we'll let you know that the presentation is expected to run approximately 35 to 40 minutes. We do invite you throughout the presentation to put your questions in the Q&A function. And following the presentation, we will deal with questions in the order in which they appear. If there's anything in the presentation that um, that you need clarification about immediately, um, if there is a, a point that you feel you can't hold the question in, go ahead and pop it in. We will be reviewing the questions throughout the presentation, and if we can stop and attend to an urgent question, we will do so. But do rest assured that we will have a good 20 minutes to deal with your questions following the presentation. So. Without further ado, it is my uh, my absolute pleasure to introduce our colleague Christian Sivier from Solimpex. Uh, following a 30-year career in international logistics in Europe and in Canada, Christian started a Montreal-based import-export consultancy in 2010. He is a subject matter expert and lectures for the Canadian International Freight Forwarders Association and also the World Federation of International Freight Forwarders. He gives conferences for various trade organizations that you might have attended, and he is a personalized training, uh, offers personalized training for importers and exporters. You may also read his articles in Inside Logistics and in Supply Professional. So I turn you over to Christian for the remainder of the presentation. Thank you very much, Kathy, and good morning or good afternoon, everyone. I'm really happy to be with you here today. Thanks to technology, we're together, even though we may we are far apart. So that's um, excellent that we're uh, able to be um, attending this together. So Kathy kindly introduced me, and so I don't need to go through that again. Just. Um, and she also very, very nicely mentioned two publications that are quite interesting, Inside Logistics and Supply Professional. Um, it's, uh, they're good Canadian publications that, are, um, that provide um, good content on international trade, importing, exporting, supply chain issues, et cetera, et cetera. I think I also, before I begin, I wanted to um, briefly confirm, of course, that um, I stand with Ukraine, we need to um, once in a while be reminded that this uh, awful war still uh, exists, still goes on, that uh, uh, Ukrainian civilians are still bombed every day. Um, and um, on this, um, in order to show my support, I'm. Uh, you might recognize the colors of the Ukrainian flag as background for my slides. Um, and so today we're going to talk about mobility, as uh, Kathy has um, uh, introduced. We're going to talk about uh, the impact of the CETA agreement on aviation, on the automobile industry, as well as for rail and marine transportation. Uh, at the beginning, I'll have uh, I'll, I'll have a few generalities just to. Um, remind us of the main principles uh, and the, the way CETA works as far as the trade in goods uh, is concerned. And then my presentation will last about 35 minutes, maybe 40 minutes at the max, and then we'll have ample time for questions at the end. So I'm really happy to be with you here today. And uh, uh, let us begin. And so we all know that um, uh, the CETA free trade agreement has been in effect uh, in full force as far as the trading of goods, as far as the importing and exporting of goods is concerned, since uh, September 2017. We know that not all EU countries have, have ratified it. However, uh, what was very neat was the fact that uh, uh, Germany ratified it not so long ago. So that's very encouraging. So there aren't so many countries that are left to ratify it. Uh, uh, we hope that uh, 
uh, French senators once uh, are will be able to ratify it soon uh, before they retire um, because there's questions in France on the age of retirement as you know or as you probably heard and so the key elements the, the, the key point is that CETA is in full effect for the trading of goods for the importing of, and exporting of products and the main impact the main advantage for um, European exporters, European companies, as well as for Canadian exporters, is the fact that we have zero tariffs on most products. And so the key component of um, uh, be able to obtain that benefit is to make sure that we comply with the rules of origin. So we'll give some examples of rules of origin. Also, I want to briefly remind everyone about uh, of the principle of how rules of origin work and why is that um, important um, is because we need to before we can claim the preferential preferential treatment we need to be sure that our products meet the rules of origin and some companies find that part a bit confusing and difficult to um, establish and so that's why I want to remind us of the main principles that guide that um, rules of origin um, uh, validation and so once our products once we validated that our products meet the rules of origin then this is when we as the exporter um, would provide us an, an origin certification that will be a legally a legally binding um, certification that will be added on our commercial invoice or actually we could put it on any document but most companies find it practical to put it on their commercial invoice and so and then that's what will trigger the fact that we can claim the preferential treatment when the goods are go through the border when the goods are cleared customs when they arrive at the Canadian port or airport of entry one detail that is important for European exporters is that for sales over 6,000 euros the uh, European exporter has to be registered in the REC system, which has been in effect um, for, for a few years now. Um, and that is done um, at the uh, local level in the customs authority of each country, of each European country. So uh, um, REC is an important element. And so most products were uh, came at 0% on September 21st, 2017, with some exceptions mainly uh, relating to food, but also relating to transportation, um, relating to uh, the automobile industry and uh, as well as the marine industry. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll touch on that actually in a moment. We'll have an opportunity to see the impact of that in, um, in the tariff. So, and if you look up the text of the, of the CETA agreement, this is where you'll see references to what's called the staging, the different staging um, milestones. So A, B, C, or D. So A refers to all the products for which um, the customs tariffs, the duties came to 0% immediately. And so that's the vast majority of, uh, of products. And so rules of origin, what do rule of origins talk about? Rules of origin basically say, that uh, products have to be either wholly obtained from the um, from from Europe or wholly manufactured in Europe uh, or manufactured from what we call originating materials, i.e., materials, raw materials, parts, components originating in Europe. So, A, B are the are the easiest rules of origin. They will apply to unmanufactured products. Um, C is the more complex one that will apply to manufactured products. Um, any products that is manufactured nowadays, um, whether it's um, in the um, transportation industry or whether it's in the um, toys industry or, or garments or, or whatnot or electronics, all manufactured products or most manufactured products have some foreign content in them foreign raw materials parts or components and we don't want these products that have foreign content to be disallowed to be disqualified under the free trade agreement and that's why we have rules that spe that specify that in order to have to, to qualify for the free trade agreement even if a product has foreign content foreign inputs it can still qualify providing it has been transformed enough 
providing the input has been transformed through the manufacturing process into a different output. So there's that kind of rules. And there's also a rule that says that we don't want um, we, we, we don't want the foreign content of any product to exceed a certain percentage. And so the, the, the trick and the difficulty sometimes with free trade agreements is the fact that there's slightly different rules that vary uh, from product to product. And that's why sometimes companies find it hard to navigate. But really, it's pretty simple because it's either of these two components, either a transformation of an input into a different output or uh, a minimum percentage of local content, i.e. a maximum percentage of foreign content. And so uh, if we're exporting um, uh, apples from um, Poland or pears from Portugal or clementines from Spain, then of course the product has been grown in the EU and, and, and harvested in the EU. And so it's automatically qualified. So rules of origin really apply to or are more, more, more elaborate for manufactured products that have foreign inputs. And so how do we read that or how do we understand it? How do we decipher it? It's based on the rules of origin are, are in numerical order and they're based on the HS code, what we call the HS code, the harmonized system code. Another wonderful European product because as you probably know, the World Customs Organization is located in Brussels. So we can truly say that the HS code is a, another great European product. Um, and so an HS code, uh, each product has, has its own HS code and it's used by customs authorities to um, assess tariffs as well as to validate rules of origin. And so it's subdivided in chapters, headings, sections, subheadings, um, which I know is a bit technical, but it's just for you to understand um, or to, to, to understand the rules of origin better. So rules of origin sometimes will refer to a chapter of the HS code, which, mean, which means they apply to all the goods in that chapter, or they'll apply to a heading, which means they apply to all the goods under a specific heading, or they, they apply to a subheading, which means they apply only to a smaller group of goods. Um, and so that's, a, that's how all these um, rules of origin are organized. And Actually, through our presentation, when we talk about precise, more precisely, right now I'm talking in general terms, of course, but we talk more precisely about the transportation industry, the transportation sectors, and I'll show you examples of the rules of origin that apply to each, each of these sectors, each of these products. So this is an example of a rule of origin in the CETA agreement. It refers to um, the uh, chapter 88, which is uh, aircraft, you know, uh, and aerospace. And then within chapter 88, there's various headings. There's 82, 8801, 8802, or 3, et cetera, et cetera. And then there could also be subheadings. And so you see for aerospace goods, uh, they can have foreign content as long as they have been transformed enough, as long as the input or the output is different from the input. And in some cases, they also need to have at least, they cannot have more than 50% of foreign content, which means they, they have to have at least 50% of local content, i.e. European content. So that's what a rule of origin looks like. And they vary slightly from product to product. And I'll show you examples of these as we move along. So just to illustrate again, the, uh, the fact that we can have foreign input as long as we uh, manufacture the input and turn it into something else, and that is validated by the change in the HS code, then our product will comply. For example, if you're making aluminum and, um, and Europe manufactures a lot of aluminum uh, and Canada as well. And uh, so it comes from bauxite, which comes mainly from West Africa, from Guinea. And so we can import bauxite and transform it into aluminum. Uh, and um, what will validate that is the fact that we have different HS codes. So you see, we go from 260600 for bauxite to 760110. And then if we, if we were in the um, industry, if we were manufacturing doors and windows, um, aluminum doors and windows, uh, there, we could also import the aluminum, believe it or not. And that's because we could use imported aluminum because we will have, in, when we make windows or doors, we'll have transformed it enough. We'll have to turn it into a different product. 
And so the HS code for aluminum sheets or ingots is 76 or 110. And the HS code for aluminum doors is 76, 10, 10. So it's a different heading. Aluminum sheets and ingots are in 7601, and aluminum doors and windows are in 7610. So that's how the, uh, the um, uh, rule of origin works when it comes to, uh, refers to tr the transformation of a foreign input into a local output with a different HS code. And then the last element I want to share with you before we go into the specifics of the transportation sectors is the fact that we can we can accumulate the content, we can add the content from Europe and from Canada in order to arrive at our percentage. And so here I'm using a Canadian example. I could have used a European example, but I know this Canadian example better. Um, and um, if you're familiar with the BRP company in Valcourt, Quebec, they make these um, stinky and noisy machines that we find um, in, in, our, uh, in, in our winter, in our Canadian winters that we find in the forest or uh, in the wild. So right now, we still use them, believe it or not, even though it's spring, but we still have snow here in Canada. So uh, we can't wait to, um, uh, for, for the snow to melt and for spring to arrive for good. But uh, the key element here that I want to share with you is the fact that these um, skidoos, and it's the same for sidoos, um, they are made in Canada from mainly from Canadian components and parts, but there's also parts coming from the US, there's also parts coming from Mexico, uh, some coming from Asia, but the, uh, the mortars are made in Austria and the tracks are made in Finland. So the, the mortars come from Graz and the tracks come from Roma, Rovaniemi in Finland. So what that means in the context of the CETA free trade agreement is the fact that when we calculate the percentage of, uh, of content that would be a, a make us qualify under the CETA agreement, we don't just use the Canadian content here, uh, we talk about a Canadian product. We can also we we also add the European content. So BRP, if we, they want to validate their percentage to make sure that they can benefit from the CETA free trade agreement and get the preferential treatment, they can add the Canadian content and the European content to come to their percentage. And of course, it's the other way around. If you are a European manufacturer of any product and you have Canadian parts. Um, then you can add the value of these two elements of the European content plus the Canadian content, and you come to the total percentage. And so this is how um, the rule, the, the rule of the, that's called the accumulation of content works to, to, to enable us to qualify under the free trade agreement. When European products come into Canada, um, they go through customs. Customs is not called customs, it's called the Canada Border Services Agency. The main documentation that's required, we talked about free, um, rules of origin and the origin certification. The main documents that are required upon importation in Canada are the commercial invoice um, on your left. And then on the right hand side is the customs entry. It's called the B3. The HS code is, is key, of course, to customs compliance because uh, this is uh, uh, the HS code determines what the rate of duty or the rate of tariff will be. Uh, in the center, I showed you, uh, I'm highlighting the Incoterms book, it's just to remind us that it is possible for a European company to sell in Canada under the DDP Incoterm, the Delivered Duty Pay Incoterm, and become then a, a non, what we call a non-resident importer. So it is possible, it is very convenient. Um, it requires some, some organization with uh, from the accounting point of view, because when we uh, bring goods into Canada, when we import goods into Canada, the Canadian importer pays um, the uh, GST uh, rate of 5%. The GST in Canada is equivalent to the VAT in Europe. So um, all this to say that the GST is normally paid by the importer, by the Canadian customer. But if the European exporter is organized to be a non-resident importer, it's possible to um, set that up uh, in a way to um, be able to claim the GST back and uh, you know so, so it's, it's necessary of course to have the right setup for that but it's something I wanted to mention in passing it is possible for a European company a European export to be to become a non-resident importer in Canada it has many advantages this way you sort of bypass the um, uh, you know importers 
uh, and you can deal directly with customers. So going into uh, transport and um, the various modes that we talked about, the key, one of the key element, uh, key changes over the last few years when it comes to the aviation industry is the fact that uh, Canada has relaxed its rules as far as foreign ownership, um, which used to be 25%, and now it's up to 49%. So a Canadian, an, an airline based in Canada and operating out of Canada, um, having Canada as its home base, could be up to 49% owned by European interest. So this is new, and it helps, uh, uh, hopefully it will help more, you know, more uh, cooperation between our two, or between the two sides, between Europe and Canada. I don't think that it had any practical um, um, impact yet. I don't think there's been any cross investments, although I could be wrong, but that's one of the main changes for the aviation industry when it comes to the Canadian market is this change in the rule for foreign ownership of airlines. Now, while we're talking about aviation, I added something here just for your information. Um, and it's because it, this just came up last week. You know, IATA has statistics every every month that uh, deal with uh, how we're doing with travel. You know, is there how, how do we compare? How do our, our travel compares with the you know pre pandemic times? And so I wanted to share these with you since we're talking about aviation. The fact that when it comes to domestic travel, and that these takes these are worldwide statistics. So just for information, for domestic travel, we're almost at par with uh, um, 2019 with pre-pandemic levels. For international traffic, we're about 70, we're about three quarters um, of um, pre-pandemic traffic. So we're at 70, 77 percent. So um, just think about what 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 that means. What that means in in, in between um, when it comes to um, air travel between Europe and Canada, it means we have we only three quarters back to pre-pandemic level uh, levels, which means that um, also in flights, we're still not back to pre-pandemic levels. So we, we have about three quarters of the capacity that we used to have in uh, 2019. So it's building up slowly, but we're not back at uh, um, pre-pandemic levels yet. Uh, most of you probably noticed that um, if you are traveling or if you intend on traveling, you see we still have we still don't have as many flights as we used to, even though it's coming back um, gradually. And so any of you who will be interested in that, I'll be happy to send you to share this uh, report with you. It's a um, three or four page detailed study of uh, where the uh, where the uh, air transportation business is at, and it bro is broken down by region. So if any of you are interested, I'll be happy to send that to you. Um, now, um, the, the impact on, we talked about the, the, the change in regulations for foreign ownership. Now, when it comes to buying and selling products, um, the CETA agreement, I have to I have to say, does not have a huge impact on that industry itself. And that's because um, the aircraft, the uh, airline aircraft industry is for the most part duty free already. So when we uh, buy and sell um, aircraft parts or, or aircrafts um, in Canada and in Europe, it's actually duty free without the free trade agreement. So therefore, no huge impact on uh, of CETA for that for that specific um, industry. Um, where do we find that information? We find that in the Canadian Customs Tariff on the CBSC website. And so on the next slides, what I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you by industry, I'm going to show you the savings that were generated by CETA, as well as the rules of origin that we have to follow, that we have to be familiar with, and that we have to comply with in order to get the duty-free um, tariff treatment. So for automobiles, and all that information is the first information, all my slides are structured the same way. At the top, you'll have the, 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 the duty rate or the uh, tariff, the applicable tariff in Canada on the products that we're going to talk about. And then at the bottom, you'll have the rule of origin that is specific to CETA. So the first part, the top part, we find that in the in the CBSA customs tariff, and the bottom is in the CETA, in the text of the CETA agreement under the rules of origin uh, in the annex that has rules of origin. So you see for, for vehicles, um, automobiles, uh, the current um, 
tariff in Canada is 6.1%. And for um, European products that are uh, comply with the rules of origin of the CETA agreement, then it's uh, 0%. It's free. So we see the Canadian customs tariff will have this column. The, the, the right-hand side column refers to free trade agreements and preferential tariff treatments. And this is where we see, we see the abbreviation CEUT, Canada European Union Tariff. And it says free. That means that um, there's 0% duties on automobiles that are coming from Europe, uh, providing they meet the rules of origin. And if they don't meet the rules of origin, or if they don't come from Europe, the, the, the tariff is 6.1%. And then at the bottom, you have the rule of origin uh, of the free trade agreement. And so you see the minimum content requirement here is 50%. So we have to have at least 50% European content in our vehicles in order to be able to claim the duty-free um, the tariff treatment in Canada. And so the 50%, again, is not just European content, it could it could include Canadian content. So a, a European automobile manufacturer who would have parts coming from Canada could add that, that percentage to the overall um, content of the, um, of the vehicle to comply with the free trade agreement. So 50% is, um, is the rule that happens, ap applies in the majority of cases. We will see that there's differences uh, for some um, products. Uh, and um, so we'll see that over the next slide. So for automobiles, uh, for, for um, vehicles, this is what the rule, this is what the tariff is. Uh, that's, so that's the tariff saving. And then this is what the rule um, of origin is. Now, if you're um, importing or exporting parts for, for parts, automobile parts, and here I just took safety belts as an example, um, the, for most parts, it's 6%. The, the, the tariff in Canada is 6%. But for, for quite a few parts, they're, they're duty-free anyway without the CETA agreement. So it varies a bit in the automobile parts industry. Some are, are at six percent, and some are duty free. And again, the rule of origin that you see at the bottom refers to fifty percent. So we can't have more than fifty percent foreign content in order for a part to qualify under the CETA agreement. So that's where that's as far as automobiles are concerned. So I wanted to share with you. We talk about transportation, even though um, we're not in Amsterdam. Uh, we're either in Toronto or in Montreal or elsewhere in Canada. Maybe if we're in BC, in Vancouver, those of you who are in BC, you have no snow anymore, so you can use your bicycles. And so what's interesting here is that the, fra the, the duty free, the duty saving, the tariff saving is quite important on bicycles because as you see here, the, the tariff on bicycles is 13% in Canada. So quite, uh, quite steep. And here, as you see at the bottom, the um, rule of origin requires 50%, no more than 50% foreign content, i.e. at least 50% of European or and Canadian content on the bicycles coming into Canada. So this is the other example I wanted to share with you. And then if we go into um, other products that are uh, related to, to, to mobility and transportation, um, buses, for example, uh, so you see that the tariff on buses is the same as on, on, the, on automobiles, 6.1%. And there, the percentage, uh, the maximum percentage of foreign content that's allowed is 45%. So you see, this is where free trade agreements can, get, can be a bit complex because they, they might have different percentages um, for different products. And so here, if you're if we, if we are manufacturing buses in Europe and we want to export them to Canada, we need to have at least 55% of European and potentially Canadian content uh, in, in the vehicle in order to qualify. We cannot have more than 45% foreign content. Trailers, uh, if we're talking about trucks and trailers, so it's pretty well the same. Uh, the tariff is 6.1% and the um, minimum content requirement is for um, uh, European content value is 65% because uh, we can't have more than 45%, sorry, 55%. We cannot have more than 45% of um, the foreign components in our, in our trucks trucks and trailers. So 
in the next slides, I'll show you different, uh, also how, how depending on the type of vehicle, it can, things can be a little different as far as the tariffs are concerned. Um, I don't want to bore you with that, but it's just to illustrate the fact that yes, so for certain products that the tariff saving is 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 more substantial. For example, um, uh, on tanker trailers, the tariff saving is nine point five percent. Whereas for farm equipment, uh, you see at the at the bottom of the of the top part there, it's uh, on, the saving is only five percent. Um, on agri products, usually um, agri control equipment, usually the tariff is lower. And so you see for these kinds of trailers, you have uh, um, the minimum uh, requirement is you cannot have more than 50% of uh, foreign content. Other types of trucks, vehicles uh, can vary a little bit. Um, uh, cranes and 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 then that are are the same as uh, v as other vehicles, six point one percent. However, at the bottom here, firefighting vehicles, um, the tariff is six point seven percent. Don't ask me why it's different, but it is different. So the saving on firefighting vehicles are, are would be a little bit uh, uh, higher because the tariff is six point seven percent. And I know we make these products in Europe. In fact. I am dealing with a customer and helping a customer um, on that um, issue on exporting European-made fire trucks, fire fighting vehicles to Canada. And so here you see the minimum uh, requirements as far as the, the content is concerned. The percentage is then 45%. So you cannot have for these specialty products, specialty vehicles, you cannot have more than 45% foreign content in it in order to qualify. Um, Trailers for, for camping is, is again a little different. It's not 6.1, it's not 6.7, it's 6.5. Uh, and there the minimum percentage or the maximum percentage of foreign content is 50%. So you see, this is how, this is the complexity of rules of origin uh, is that uh, they have slight differences between, you know, different products. Uh, and, and the key to that is, is the HS codes, as we see here is the, the HS code is the key to the, finding the right tariff. It's also the key to finding the rule of origin that applies to this product. And so we're going to touch a little bit. I want to share with you a little bit of information on, uh, on how it looks like with the railway equipment. So here the tariff is quite steep. It's 9.5%. So no matter what kind of uh, locomotive you might be um, um, exporting, then the, the, the tariff saving would be 9.5%. 9, 9 and the percentage requirement is 50%. So it's pretty standard. For rail cars, whether they are passenger cars or uh, for um, cargo, um, then this, the saving is even more uh, interesting. It's it's eleven percent. So um, the um, so that's that's how it is with um, railway equipment for uh, rail railway um, uh, locomotives. The saving is nine point five percent for cars. Whether they're freight cars or passenger cars, the saving is 11%. And the um, maximum foreign content, content is 50%. So um, that's, um, that's what, um, uh, how it looks like for um, railway equipment, which could cover you know, uh, subways and, 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 and products like this. And now we're ending actually on, I wanted to end with Marine. Uh, because it's kind of an interesting um, domain as well. Um, in marine, for uh, boats like uh, cruise ships, okay, I don't know, um, I guess cruise ships, yes, uh, we, we make, uh, we have a, quite a big manufacturing industry of cruise ships in Europe. Uh, and there, um, the um, tariff is 25% in Canada. So, that is uh, quite steep. And so that would apply not just to cruise ships, but also to ferries, for example. And there, 
Um, so it's interesting because on the one hand, the tariff is, is quite steep, right? It's 25%. It's not back, it's not down to 0% yet. It's at 3%. It's because it was the, the tariff reduction was phased in over several years. And then you see at the bottom, what's also interesting is that you have a, a more restriction as far as the uh, percentage of foreign content because you cannot have more than 40% of foreign content. So you see for most other... <clears throat> vehicles it was 50 percent and for um, the ships it's uh, 40 percent so that's what it looks like for the marine field for the marine industry um, we need um, I don't know if we need cruise ships in Canada but we need ferries you know and, and that types of uh, of um, of ships and then one that I wanted to share with you uh, is simply because uh, one of the reasons I thought of that is you know um, you might say to yourself, well, is that something that's really um, useful? Is there really such a, such a business existing? Well, a good, friend of, a good friend of mine has bought a sailboat from France, um, not last year. And, um, you know, one of these specialty catamarans that we don't really find in Canada, we don't find the same features shall we say i almost said the same quality you know i should say we don't find the same features and it can be dismantled and shipped in a container it fits in a container and there the saving for these kinds of boats you know sailboats and and, and that is uh, 9.5 percent the duty um, tariff was 9.5 percent until the CETA agreement and then Thanks to CETA for that, we are enjoy a zero percent um, tariff, and the provision or the, the 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 rule of origin requirement is that we can't have more than forty percent of the um, of foreign content on that boat, you know, on that sailboat or whatnot. So that's what I wanted to share with you as well. You, we see it's different; it's like the rules are slightly different between a commercial ships, uh, uh, ferries, and that. And that, I guess that that would apply also to fishing vessels. And then the pleasure crafts, well, is slightly different, um, but there's still a substantial saving to uh, to be had, um, and so which means is which means the Canadian market has great potential for European exporters, European manufacturers of these types of um, the products, which is great news. And so now i'm uh, before ending my presentation and um i'm almost done i um and then we can have uh, questions of course we can have uh, i'll be happy to exchange with you i always like to end my presentations for a european audience just to highlight the fact that in canada we are very close to the us we do a lot of business with the us uh, in fact three quarters of canadian exports go to the us and so what's very interesting is that Canadian com European companies that take an interest in the Canadian market, thanks to the CETA agreement, can also um, think about serving the US market from Canada, i.e. start in Canada, thanks to the CETA agreement, and then from Canada, build your business into the US. So that's why I like to end my presentation with this. I'll be very brief on it. Uh, so I just want to remind, remind us that Canada has a free trade agreement with the US and Mexico. And so um, it could be possible, uh, depending on the product and depending on, on your manufacturing process, it could be possible to bring European products into Canada um, duty-free thanks to the CETA agreement. And then if your product can be can, can undergo some transformation in Canada, some assembly or whatnot, it could qualify under the um, Canada-USA-Mexico free trade agreement. Um, so that... You know, some companies do that, some European companies do that, then of course it becomes technical because what do we have to look for? We have to look for the rules of origin that govern the free trade agreement between Canada and the US to see if our product will qualify. But it's something that can be done and that, that can work depending on the type of product you're, you're selling. And uh, it's very easy to serve the US market from Canada because whether you're in Toronto or in Montreal, or even in Vancouver, we're all an hour or two from the US border. And it's very common for Canadian companies themselves to, to consolidate shipments and to, uh, and to even have uh, distribution centers um, just at the border. So for European companies, um, attacking the Canadian market first and then build the uh, presence in the US from Canada is very 
smooth and, and very easy and, uh, and um, uh, quite convenient. And, and many European companies do that. So I just, that's why I wanted to bring that to your attention, you know, um, at the end of my um, presentation so that you're conscious of that, of these possibilities. And then last point the, um, that I want to bring to your attention as well is the, the very high limit, the very high duty-free limit for U.S. consumers it's called the 321 section 321 and that's very beneficial for e-commerce what it means is that a us consumer who buys a product anywhere in the world or from anywhere in the world has a duty free allowance of $800 so it's highly beneficial for for e-commerce of course and so it's very practical for european companies who are selling online to serve the, both the Canadian and the US market from a Canadian based distribution center. And so that's what I wanted to end my presentation with. I hope I have not been, I was not too, too long on that. I thank you all very much for your attention. Um, and I'm certainly hoping that you enjoyed the presentation, that it was useful. And uh, I'm looking forward to exchanging with you. Um, and so I'm passing the microphone back to Kathy. So, Kathy, over to you. Thank you all for your attention. Terrific. Thank you very much, Christian. We have a question to kick us off. And um, while we're dealing with this question, I would invite the rest of you to go ahead and add your questions to the Q&A function. So, Christian, uh, what would be the difference if it is marine for commercial purposes versus passenger leisure? Yes. So, so actually, um, um, the um, the difference in, um, in as far as the rule of origin is is there's no difference in the rule of origin. You have to have a fifty percent you have a fifty percent limit on foreign content. Uh, the difference between the two is that for commercial uh, you have a greater saving because the tariff is higher for commercial uh, mm -hmm. boats than for uh, pleasure boats, as we saw the examples on the sailboat and the. Um, uh, ferries, you know, the, for ferries it was twenty five percent. So the tariff is twenty five percent. So so the potential saving is twenty five percent, as opposed to for sailboats, I think it was eleven percent, if I'm not mistaken. So that's the main difference. As far as the rules of origin, they are identical. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm not seeing any questions, um, folks. We've got. We've got 15 minutes we're very happy to engage with you so it was Absolutely. it was a very thorough presentation and and perhaps you were just too perfect christian but I, i'm sure uh, that we've <laughs> got some curious minds out there who might want to ask yes absolutely and don't hesitate if there's anything you know even that might seem trivial uh you know that you want to clarify please don't hesitate um, we're here for you we're at your disposal should you ask a question to which we don't have the answer well we'll look into it and get back to you so so don't worry so all questions are welcome so please feel free to um, while we're waiting for for people to get their courage up do you have anything else that um i mean you were time bound so you could only put so much in your presentation was there anything else that you were really hoping you'd like to share or talk about that you were concerned we wouldn't have time for because i think we've got a bit of time now Yes, well, I mean, the thing is that, of course, for I, I tried to emphasize or to highlight the importance of rules of origin and uh, and show how they are organized. And this is sometimes when I present to companies or when I meet companies, it's an area that's is a, that's a bit mysterious to some. So what I'm hoping for is that I I was able through this a brief presentation to demystify the the rules of origin. Um, concept or, or you know practicalities and so i find many companies um, sometimes well even sometimes just miss opportunities because they find that too complicated and they say okay that's too complicated i'm not even going to go for it you know um so that i think is sometimes a, a stumbling block for companies and uh, also sometimes what can happen is that if you don't fully understand the rules of origin and uh, you can um uh, you know, sign your certificate of origin declaration and your goods will go through and uh, there'll be no problem until some, some time where there's a customs audit. So um, uh, it's very important for companies to, to be fully familiar with the rules of origin and, and to make sure that they comply with them and also to build up the traceability of, of these components. Um, so what, what does that mean, the traceability? It means if customs... If customs anywhere um, 
wants to have the proof that you that you comply with the rules of origin, then you have to have a, at your disposal, you have to have your bills of material, you have to have your invoices from vendors, you know, including foreign vendors, so that you can easily prove that you met the percentage or you met the transport the transformation requirement. So I find this to be often misunderstood by companies, uh, by, by exporters. Of course, particularly SMEs, because for SMEs, it's a bit more um, difficult. They don't have the resources uh, in-house. Uh, large multinationals um, master that uh, quite well, but even large companies sometimes don't fully comprehend the rules of origin. So that's the main, one of my main um, uh, concern or, or question mark sometimes when I help companies that are um, developing markets abroad, you know, whether they are European companies or or Canadian companies is um, the mastering the rules of origin and understanding the impact. I can imagine that the potholes would be easily fallen into um, if you're if you're a new exporter, especially if you're an SME, as you say, with limited resources and probably all the more reason to be working with a broker if you're just beginning this aspect of your business. Um, we have a question that is yes. a more general in nature about the CEDA. Very interesting question. Which industries in your personal experience, Christian, have been affected most by CETA? Uh, well, it's a good question. Um, I see. Um, I mean, we could we could, we could look at it. I mean, I don't, I don't know the statistics um, of uh, by heart, and so I will go purely purely by my feeling. But my feeling is that <laughs> you know we could be guided by the saving in in tariff. So, for example. We know that there's an extremely high tariff in Canada on cheese, right? So um, thanks to CETA, we opened up, we opened a large quota for European cheese. So we find a lot more European cheese uh, in Canada. So that, that's one industry, the dairy industry has benefited quite, quite a bit. And you know, there's high tariffs also on textiles, on garments, on, on uh, and uh, so I think we find more choices of these um, these types of, of products. And uh, I don't know offhand, I, I'm not, uh, I haven't looked at statistics, but the, in the automobile industry, logically, because of the, tar the gradual tariff reduction, um, um, European automobiles are going to be 6.1% cheaper than they used to be before CETA. So there has to be a, um, an impact on that industry as well. But I'm not. I haven't looked at the statistics. But logically, there should be an impact. We should be seeing more um, European vehicles in Canada. Very interesting. And of course, uh, I'd be very interested, actually, on your comments on on the luxury tax that is being levied um, for luxury automobiles entering the Canadian market, and and how I'm putting you on the spot here, um, and whether or not you would see that as um, contravening the CETA in any way. Well, that's a good question. That would be, I mean, um, there's always a provision in every trade or free trade agreement, I mean, um, that um, a country can still create its own rules. Um, and we see it um, once in a while, we're seeing it with anti-dumping tar tariffs, you know. Uh, I mean, that applies more to um, to the U.S. trade because the, the U.S. in the past have had these anti-dumping tariffs every now and then. And uh, on, on different European products, uh, but but focusing on Canada to to US between Canada and the US, once in a while we have anti-dumping tariffs, and uh, it it illustrates the fact that even though we have a free trade agreement, we can still have anti-dumping tariffs if they are justified. So the whole question is, are they justified? You know, anti-dumping tariffs are applied when um, a product is sold under cost or when a product is subsidized. And so um, having an anti-dumping tariff on some products uh, could be justified or maybe it's not justified. And so it usually takes years, it takes armies of lawyers and it, sometimes it goes up to the World Trade Organization to get uh, these types of situations settled. Um, and so it, it's, it's complex. So whether the Luxury tax um, or on luxury tax on luxury vehicles is contradicts CETA. It's a would be a good question for a um, a trade lawyer to answer. And uh, I'm afraid I don't have the <laughs> the ready made answer to that. 
Um, Fair enough. It's just uh, certainly uh, topical these days. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions. Uh, is there anything else before we wish everybody a good day? Is there anything else that you'd like to uh, draw our attention to, Christian? Um, well, I would say uh, let's keep uh, our opportunities open, and um, we, the, the CETA has all kinds of um, of uh, opportunities opened up, all kinds of doors. And I think what we should do from both sides, but I would say my 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 call to European companies is take an interest in the Canadian market. The Canadian market is is relatively small. However, it's a great stepping stone into the U.S. market. And I would say also. Um, let's take advantage of the fact that uh, we, we have more events in person now. We, we, we're slowly coming out. We slowly came out of the pandemic where we couldn't go anywhere, where we couldn't attend trade shows and conferences. And so I invite European companies to come to Aeromart in Montreal for the aerospace industry or to come to the Seattle in Toronto for the food industry, where, 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 or we had the... Um, the mining show in Toronto uh, last month. So I invite European companies to um, uh, come to Canada and visit all these trade shows that are that are great opportunities to to meet new clients or potential clients. We're certainly getting back out there. Look, we got lucky. I think my my threat to end the webinar prompted some more questions. Here's two for you. Um, what's the most overlooked benefit with CETA, and what, in your opinion, is the biggest barrier with accessing the agreement? Okay, well. The most overlooked benefit of CETA, I would say, um, is that um, um, not everyone knows that it exists, and uh, you know, it's uh, it's not. Uh, I, I'm here. I'm more speaking from a Canadian perspective, but I think also in Europe, you know, Europe in Europe do 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 every does everyone in, who is in business um, know about the CETA agreement? I'm not certain. I think the the main obstacle is that it's not a it's not such a high profile agreement. I mean, Canada is a great place and it has a very positive um, uh, image in Europe. But but do do all companies in Europe who, who could benefit from it are they all aware that there is a free trade agreement with Canada? I, I'm not certain, and I can tell you from a Canadian perspective. There are many Canadian companies that don't know that there is a free trade agreement, or um, that believe it's not in in effect because they hear, you know, that uh, somebody in Italy doesn't like it, or somebody in Belgium doesn't like it, or or somebody in France doesn't like it, and uh, um, France has not ratified it yet, for example. Uh, so there is this um, this um, um, work that I think still needs to be done to make companies aware of it and to to make companies on both sides aware of the advantages and and also to reaffirm the fact that it's in full effect as far as the trading of goods are concerned as far as selling buying tariffs it's uh it's a hundred percent in effect so um and let's, so let's put aside the fact that it's and it's still under provisional implementation because of the ratification that is not complete but let's not worry about that so that's it's a long um answer to your question about the most overlooked benefit and i think that's it it's the most overlooked benefit is is it's 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 it, 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 it existence um or not and i would say then the biggest barriers for access, assessing your accessing the agreement i mean they all reside in to the the fact that uh, um on both sides of the Atlantic, we do, we still have our own rules as far as the um, as far as safety of products, or you know, could it be it could be food safety, it could be safety uh, for children, for toys, it could be um, for the farmer industry. So, the fact that we have a free trade agreement does not mean that we harmonize our rules for products. Um, we still have our rules, and sometimes it is tricky for um, Canadian companies to meet the EU rules on some food products, for example, and perhaps the same happens you know, the other way around. It might be tricky sometimes for European companies to um, adapt their product to Canadian standards. The automobile industry is a good one. You know, there's, 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 
rules on the automotive industry are different in Europe than in Canada. In Canada, we tend to follow the US rules as far as safety and this and that for, for automobiles. So I think that could be um, an example of the of some of the challenges that we meet is the fact that having a free trade agreement does not mean that we harmonize everything and all, all our rules. And um, so that's, I think, something that uh, um, can be an obstacle sometimes or a barrier. That was a most interesting and thorough answer. Um, we have another one. I don't know if you would know. Is there any trade show for railways, uh, infrastructure, or rolling stock or signaling in Canada in the foreseeable future? Uh, that, uh, Guido, I'm not sure, but but uh, I don't know, but uh, I'm sure it exists. And uh, it is something I, can, I, can, I could get back to you on that. I, in fact, I met somebody last week from the Railway Association of Canada, so they they would probably know, I'm sure. And so there must be there must be one. I don't know if there's a whole a, a Canadian one. The thing in Canada sometimes is we might have regional shows. You know, there might be something in Ontario for for the Ontario market, uh, as opposed to for the whole Canadian market. But uh, um, so uh, I'm not sure. I, 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 I believe it must exist. Um, it's something that um, I could, could try to get back to you on. And feel free to reach out directly, Guido, to you, Ken. We, um, we just completed Absolutely. a sustainable railways working group. And I'm sure that somebody in that group would be able to signpost us to upcoming events. So don't hesitate to reach out directly. Um, if Absolutely. there, let's just have a quick look here and make sure there isn't a final question coming in. These have been terrific. And um, thank you. OK, we'll take note of your uh, email address, Guido. Thank you very much. Well, look at folks, I'd like to thank, first of all, our tremendous uh, presenter, Christian. That was just terrific. It's um, it's a minefield, let's be honest. And so this was very, very useful. And thanks to all of you for participating and for your questions. It, I always say when somebody asks a question, 10 more people were probably thinking the same question. So thanks for coming forward and being generous with your with your thoughts and queries. Do follow us on social media and visit our UCAN website from time to time. Be sure that you're um, signed up to receive our communiques and our monthly newsletters to find out what's happening. We have another seminar coming up. I think it's on our webinars on the 13th of April. Um, you'd be very welcome to join us if it's relevant to the type of business you're doing. And uh, let's see what's coming as we finally launch into a very late spring here in Canada. Um, thank you very much for your participation and we look forward to seeing you soon. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. And, um... Thank you, everyone, for your attention. Bye for now. Bye-bye.